beginning in verse number 25. It says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you've answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Father, I pray today that you would be glorified as your word is preached. I pray that we would have ears to hear. Help us, Father, to know how to be the kind of neighbor that you call us to be. In Jesus' name. This morning we are beginning a new series called How to Neighbor. In this series we're going to be looking at four big issues that our culture is confronted with each and every day and how we can be part of the solution as neighbors. Today we are going to kick this series off by looking at a topic that is very much front and center in our nation right now and that is racism. Unfortunately we are very much a racially divided nation right now. I think all of us are aware of this reality, and so I don't think examples are necessary to prove the point. We are a racially divided nation, and I believe God expects us to be the kind of neighbors that help bring about reconciliation and not further separation. Here in Luke chapter 10, we find Jesus teaching us how we can be such a neighbor. It all begins with a question. An expert in the law stands up to test Jesus. This man was someone who was very well acquainted with the law of Moses. No doubt he was someone that people would have called upon to interpret the law if they had any questions and needed clarity. And so he stands up to test Jesus. In other words, this expert in the law, he wants to see how well Jesus knows the law. And that's kind of funny if you think about it. Jesus is the Son of God. He is the one who gave the law. If you think about it, it would kind of be like an expert composition teacher testing Beethoven on the Fifth Symphony. It's kind of funny, isn't it? But here this man is. He's, he's, he's trying to test Jesus to, to see how much Jesus knows about the law. And so he asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, he does what he typically did in situations like this. He responded not with an answer, but with a question himself. Verse 26. What is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? Jesus does something awesome in this moment. It starts with the man putting Jesus to the test. But it ends with Jesus putting him to the test. It's almost like Jesus is saying, you're the acclaimed expert, so let's find out just how much you really know. How do you interpret the law as it pertains to the stated question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We find the man's answer in verse 27. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says that's the correct answer. If you do this, 
You'll live. Now you got to wonder if this guy ever figured out that Jesus had turned the table on. And you know, that's neither here nor there, but that's just something I kind of found myself thinking about as I, as I studied this, this passage. And so this, this expert is doing really good. I mean, everything is going really good at this moment for this expert. He, he's given the correct answer. He's proven that he's interpreting the law correctly as it relates to eternal life. But then comes verse 29. But he wanted to justify himself. And so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? This man has already revealed that he knows that the law teaches that he is to love his neighbor. The problem is that there are some people that he is excluding as a neighbor. You see, the Jews, they had a very narrow definition of neighbor. Most Jews considered a neighbor to be someone that, that lived near them or someone that was like them. That was their definition of a neighbor. And so this narrow definition of neighbor, it excluded people like Samaritans. It excluded people like Gentiles. This man knew that he was to love his neighbor, but he also knew his neighbor, his definition of neighbor wasn't inclusive of everyone. And so he wanted to do something. He wanted to justify his actions. He wanted to prove that his actions were right. And so he asked Jesus to state his definition of neighbor. Jesus, I know I'm to love my neighbor, but I'm not loving everyone. So Jesus, you tell me. What is the definition? of a neighbor. I wonder how many of us are having a verse 29 moment today. We know that the Bible tells us that we're to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. But we also know that our definition of neighbor isn't inclusive of everyone. And so we ask Jesus, who's my neighbor? In order to prove our actions of exclusion to be right. I mean, I know that I'm to, I'm to love my neighbor, but does that include the people that listen to the wrong kind of music? I mean, I know I'm to love my neighbor, but, but does that mean the people that have colored hair and, and body piercings and, and tattoos? I know that I'm to love my neighbor, but does that include people who don't believe in you? I know that I'm to love my neighbor, but does that include people who have a different color of skin? Jesus, I know that I'm to love my neighbor, but who is my neighbor? That was the question this man had then, and maybe that is the question that we have today. Now what's interesting is that Jesus doesn't define who a neighbor is. That's what the man wants him to do. The man wants Jesus to define what a neighbor is, but Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, he demonstrates how to be a neighbor. Jesus does this by telling a story. The story that I just read, it begins in verse 30. It tells about a man who's going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he fell into the hands of robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, they beat him, and they went away, leaving him half dead. The journey from Jerusalem to Jericho was a 17-mile journey. It was a journey that was notorious for being dangerous. The reason it was so dangerous is because the terrain made it very easy for robbers to hide out and wait for unsuspecting travelers. It still happens to this very day. In our story, the unsuspecting traveler is a Jewish man. He's making his way to Jericho and suddenly he finds himself surrounded by robbers. They take his clothes, they beat him, they leave him half dead. And then comes verses 31 and 32. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. And so the first person on the scene is a priest. Now we all have an image of a priest, right? Well, more than likely, this priest is going home, having just finished serving in the temple in Jerusalem. 
He sees this man lying in the road, and he passes by on the other side. In other words, he goes out of his way not to help the man. Now, there are all kinds of speculations as to why this priest didn't help, but that's all they are, they're speculations. The reason why this priest didn't help is not the focus, and that's why Jesus doesn't tell us the reason why the man didn't stop. That's not the important point. The important point is that the man didn't stop the help. It doesn't matter the reason. The focus is that he didn't help. The next person on the scene is a Levite. A Levite was someone that served as an assistant to the priest. They would keep the utensils of the temple clean. They would open and shut the gates of the temple they would sing hymns, among other things. And again, more than likely, he's going home, having just finished serving in the temple. And he sees this man lying in the road, and he does the exact same thing as the priest. He passes by on the other side. He goes out of his way not to help this man. But, verse 33 continues. And this is where I need your help. I want everybody to, to look at your Bible. And I want, you to, I want you to tell me what comes next. But. Oh, you're going to do better than that. But. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, then he put him on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The third man on the scene is a Samaritan. We don't know where he's going or what he's been doing. All we know is that when he sees the man lying in the road, he goes to him and he helps him. Now this is a surprise. It may not be a surprise to us. Some of us, we've, we've grown up we've, in church and we've heard this story and we've heard it so many times that we're kind of numb to what a surprise it is. But I want to tell you something. When Jesus told this story to that expert in the law, it was a surprise. It was a huge surprise. Now, had the priest stopped, wouldn't have been a surprise. It wouldn't have been a surprise to us, right? We expect that a priest would stop and help somebody. Right? I mean, you would expect a preacher to help somebody. Same thing going on right here. But it doesn't happen. We, we wouldn't be surprised had the Jew, or had the Levite stopped to help this Jew. Why? Because it would have been a Levite helping another Jew. The priest would have been helping another Jew. No surprises there, right? But... It's a surprise when we read that a Samaritan stops to help this Jew. It's a very unexpected surprise. It's an unexpected surprise to that teacher of the law. He really didn't see that coming at all. The fact that, that this Samaritan stops and helps this Jew is a surprising detail of this story. The reason it's such an unexpected surprise is because Jews hated Samaritans and Samaritans hated Jews. It was a hatred that had been going on, get this, get this, for 700 years. 700 long years, the Jews had hated the Samaritans and the Samaritans had hated the Jews. 700 years prior, when the Jews were exiled into Babylon, there were some who were allowed to stay behind. Those Jews that stayed behind, they ended up marrying people from a different race. And together they had children, biracial children. The Jewish people, they hated these biracial offspring known as Samaritans. In fact, they called them half-breeds. They had a major disdain for them. And so the hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans, it ran deep. Therefore, when this Samaritan went out of his way to help this Jew, it was breaking the cultural norm of the day. 
The normal thing for a Samaritan to do was to hate a Jew. But that's not what a neighbor does. The story begins with the expert asking who he has to, who he has to love as his neighbor. But I want you to notice the question Jesus asked when the story ends. Look again if you would. Verse 36. Jesus asked the expert in the law, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The question goes from who do I have to love as my neighbor to who do you think was a loving neighbor? The expert in the law, he knew the answer. He knew the answer was neither the priest nor the Levite, but he couldn't bring himself to say the Samaritan. Again, that's how much the Jews hated the Samaritans. This expert in the law, he couldn't even bring himself to say the word Samaritan. Therefore, he simply says, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus looks at the expert and you know what he said? I want you to go and I want you to do likewise. In other words, go and be a loving neighbor to everyone that has a need, regardless of their race. Go and love your neighbor that is different from you, no differently than you love yourself. Today we need to understand that there is no room for racism in the neighborhood of God. To hate those that are different than us is contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. Listen to what Jesus says in Luke 6, verses 32 through 36. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. You will be children of the Most High because he, is the kind, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. As children of God, we are to love those different than us. <coughs> if we don't, then we are not living according to the law of love that is found in, and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. You know, racism may be culturally right, but it isn't biblically right. We need to understand that racism is not a skin issue, it's a sin issue. James chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, in other words, if you discriminate, if you show partiality, you sin, and you are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. That's what Jesus said. Listen, if you grew up in a culture that taught that racism is okay, then understand it is a teaching that is in conflict with Scripture. Please understand that racism is something that is taught. The Jews and the Samaritans, they were not born hating each other. When that little Jew was born, that little Jew didn't hate that Samaritan. When that Samaritan was born, that little infant Samaritan didn't hate the Jews. They were taught to hate each other. And the same can be said about us. We are not born racist. We are taught to be racist. Dennis Leary said it well when he said this. He said, racism isn't born, folks. It's taught. I have a two-year-old son. You know what he hates? Naps. <laughs> if you have a preschool child, you know this is true. <laughs> preschool child, they don't see someone that has a different color of skin than them playing on the playground and say, I'm not going to play with you. They don't look like me, so I don't like them. I witnessed 
this. This week, as we were on vacation, we were down in Alabama, and we were at a McDonald's, and I watched because I knew what I was preaching. And my, my kids, they were, they were waiting anxiously for their Happy Meal at McDonald's. And they, you know, the McDonald's, they have what the current Happy Meal toy is plastered right there as you walk in. So my kids, the first thing when they walk in McDonald's, that's where they are. And they're, they're standing there looking at these toys. And I watch. And here comes a little African-American little girl. And she comes over there. And, and, and she didn't look at my children and say, they don't look like me. I'm going to stay away from them. My kids, when, when they were standing there, they didn't look over and think, they didn't do that. There's nothing in their heart right now that says, I hate that person. And if I have anything to do with it, and if Melissa has anything to do with it, they will never have that kind of hate in their heart for anyone. And so, the, you know, racism is not, you're not born a racist, you're taught to be a racist. Amen. That's right. And it's such a beautiful picture when you see these little, innocent children at school playing together on the playground. And we adults, we, we segregate and we, we push people aside and we say, you don't look like us, you don't act like us. Listen, we don't want to be around you. Oh, it's such a beautiful thing to watch these little precious babies Interacting with one another. Don't you know it must make God smile? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When he sees what, what, what's intended to happen throughout our entire life, we, we begin that way and then we, we begin to be taught because of experiences that maybe our parents had or a friend had. We begin, or maybe we've had an experience ourselves. We begin to hate someone that's not like the Bible teaches that we're to love those different than us no differently than we love ourselves. So how do we do that? How do we do it? Because we need to figure it out. We have to figure it out. God has called us to be people who lead the way when it comes to these important issues of our day. We don't look to Washington. We don't look to, to the government to help us figure this out. We, the church, we are the answer to this society and the problems that we have. God has called us to lead the way. So how do we do it? How do we do it? Listen, I know that this is uncomfortable. I know that these are not the kind of sermons that we want to hear, but that there's kind of sermons we need to hear. The church has been silent too long on the issues of the day, and so we have to begin to speak up. Amen. Because the Bible has something to say about these things. Right. So how do we do this? How do we become people that bring about racial reconciliation instead of people causing racial separation? First, we have to recognize our prejudices. The first step to becoming an ambassador of racial reconciliation is to admit any prejudice that we have. What does the word prejudice mean? It means prejudging. It's a preconceived opinion that is not based on reason or actual experience. Maybe your parents had a bad experience with one rich person. Just one. And so as a result, you grew up being taught that all rich people are greedy. You have a preconceived opinion about rich people that is not based on reason or actual experience. This happens all the time as it relates to people of a different race or, or ethnicity than us. We, we prejudge an entire race based on some bad apples in the bunch. Every race has bad apples in the bunch. Amen. And so we must not prejudge an entire race of people on someone else's experience or our own bad experience. 
If we are going to be ambassadors of racial reconciliation, we must recognize any prejudices we have and then repent of them. This is not an easy step. Prejudices are difficult to see in the mirror because we often we feel justified in how we feel. But today we must look long and hard in the mirror of God's word and we must recognize any prejudices we might have. Second, we have to seek opportunities to get to know those different than us. We have to seek opportunities to get to know those different than us. You know, just because someone has a different color of skin than we do, or comes from a different ethnicity than us, doesn't mean they're all that different than us. In fact, it's likely that we have more in common than we don't have in common. If we're going to be ambassadors of racial reconciliation, it requires that we look for opportunities to get to, 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 get to know those different than us. And again, I put that word different. Because as we do that, it's likely that we will discover that we have many of the same hopes and dreams. We have many of the same fears and concerns. We have many of the same values and beliefs. We're really not all that different. Things that we have in common that, we, that can bring us together in reconciliation. And even in those things in which we differ, we can still learn something that will help us move closer in understanding rather than farther away in misunderstanding. So we have to seek opportunities to get to know those different than us. The opportunities are out there. We just have to take them. We have to be willing to strike up a conversation with someone that doesn't look like us. And as we begin to visit with them, I promise you, we will find that we have so much in common. More in common than we, don't, than we do that we don't have in common. So we have to take those opportunities. <clears throat> Again, we have to be like those, those little children who, who take those opportunities when, when, when someone comes up to them, they, 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 what's your name? What do you like to play? Do you like Barbies? Do you like Paw Patrol? Do you like, what's the pet one that's out right now? Pet what? Life of Pets. Do you like Life of Pets? And you know what? So many times when they, when they begin to talk with one another, these little kids, they find out, yeah, I like Paw Patrol. <laughs> you do? I like Barbies. I like trucks. I like pizza. I really like ice cream. Amen. What else can I talk about for the next few minutes while you sit there waiting for me? The point is, they have so much in common. And if we would just start talking, instead of prejudging, we would find that we have so much in common. So we have to look for those opportunities to get to know those different than us. And third and finally, we have to love those different than us. The true mark of discipleship is not how many times we come to church. It's not how much we give when the offering plate is passed around. It's not how many Bible verses we've memorized. All of these are important but they are not the true mark of discipleship. Jesus tells us what the true mark of discipleship is and found in John chapter 13, verse 35. He says, by this, all men will know that you are my best disciples if you love. <clears throat> love. 
Loving one another is the true mark of discipleship. I want you to notice that Jesus didn't say, all men will know that you're my disciples if you love another one like me. Jesus said, all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one. That's it. We are to love those like us. And we are to love those not like us. We are to love one another. That's what disciples of Jesus do. We love like the Samaritan. We love those different than us. Right before Jesus tells us in verse 35 that the true mark of discipleship is our love for one another, Jesus says this in verse 34. He says, a new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Let me ask you a question. Were the original 12 disciples to whom Jesus made this, this statement, were they different than Jesus? Yes. Think about it. Were they? Were they different than Jesus? Of course they were. He was righteous. They weren't. He was holy. They weren't. He was God. They weren't. They were different, but Jesus still loved them. Jesus says, as I have loved you, those of you who are different than me, as I have loved you, so you must love. One another. We must love those different than us because that's what disciples do. I'm so glad that Jesus loved someone that was different. Because had he not, he would have said, you know what? That Travis, he, he, he's not like he's not like me. He's, he's different than me. He's unrighteous. He misses the mark. I don't think I, I don't really just don't think I want to go out of my way to lay down on a cross and give my life for him. I think I'll pass by. No. Jesus is the supreme example of what it looks like to neighbor. Jesus left heaven and he came here for all of us who were different than him so that we could become like him. Not that we are God, but that we would become like him in our righteousness because he is righteous. He imparts his righteousness to us. Listen, right now I'm in a process where, where I'm becoming more and more like Jesus every single day. And one day I'm going to be glorified. I'm going to be in heaven. And listen, what a day that's going to be. But until then, Jesus continues to draw close to me. He continues to work on me. He continues, continues to help me when I, where I need help. And that's what he wants us to. I want to ask you today. Are you willing to admit your prejudices, prejudices today? God wants us to be ambassadors of racial reconciliation. We have to admit it. Jesus wants us to love as he loves us. Sacrificially, unconditionally, but different. You know, heaven's going to be a place full of people different than us. If we think for a moment that heaven's going to look like this, we're going to read Revelation. I want you to listen to this. John, he, he describes this vision that he has of heaven. I want you to listen to how he describes it in Revelation 7, verses 9 and 10. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, 
standing before the throne of the, of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice. Notice they were unified. No division in heaven. Salvation belongs to our God. Not salvation belongs to my God, but salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Heaven is going to be a place full of people different than us, but in Jesus Christ, we are one. There is no racism in the kingdom of God. Therefore, our prayer as it relates to racism must be this one. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. God's people, we need to understand that we have a big task in front of us. The racial divide in our nation is huge. But it's not a divide so big that it can't be bridged by the people of God through the power of God. As we recognize our prejudices, as we seek opportunities to get to know those different than us and love those different than us, we will break the cultural norm of our day and we will help build a bridge of racial reconciliation. That's what Jesus did. That's what the Samaritans did. That's what we must do. That's how we make it. As I bring this to a close, I want to do so. I read one final passage of scripture. Some of you today, you're sitting here, you're lost, you're separated from Jesus. Jesus, he's the great reconciler. He came to reconcile us back to God. And he's willing to do that today. He's willing and ready to reconcile anyone here who's, who's, who's separated from God. Listen, Jesus is willing to bring you back. I want you to listen to this. In Romans chapter 10. Very, very familiar um, Passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 10. In fact, if I said Romans 10, 9, many of you could, could quote that. But I want to back up. It says this. In verse 9, it says, That if you confess with your mouth Jesus the Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Listen to this. For, for there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone to call on the name of the Lord, will be saved. There is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. Jesus will save the Jew. He'll save the Gentile. He'll save anyone who calls upon his name. And so today, if you're sitting here and you've never called on the name of the Lord, understand Jesus, his arms are wide open. That He's waiting for you. He has been waiting for this ever since he created you. And even before then, he's been waiting. And he doesn't want to spend another moment separated. So today, in just a few moments, we're going to have what we call a, a time of invitation. It's simply your opportunity to respond to whatever God is, is telling you to do. And if God is telling you to walk this aisle and to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to do that. If God is, if, 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 he's, if he's walking by right now and he's tapping you on the shoulder and he's saying, You've got some prejudices in your heart. And now is the time to come to the altar and begin to admit them. It's okay. Because here's, here's the reality. And I'm just going to go, go ahead and say this, okay? The elephant's in the room, so let's just acknowledge it. We all have prejudices. So if you see somebody come down here, just understand they're just like you. 
They're just saying, I want to admit it. You don't have to come down here and admit it. You can admit it right where you're at. You can turn that very seat that you're sitting in right now. You can turn that into an altar. The important thing is that you just do it. We all have a long ways to go. Our country needs, needs us to step up and lead the way in this. I don't know about you, but it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. And I, I want my children to, to have a, a, a better future than I, than, than I had when I was their age. I want, I, want them, I want to leave America in a much better place than it was when I got here. I really do. Don't you? It starts with us. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around.